welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom Ray, and on today's show, I meet with a painter and mixed media artist online. Sophia goes by Black Butterfly Studio. So her Instagram profile is The Black Butterfly Studio, and she also has a website, blackbutterflystudio.com. I think that I met Sophia online because what I like to do is on Instagram, I will just go to the Instagram search and then choose Madison. And I'll scroll through all the stuff that's tagged for Madison. And mainly I'll just look for artists there, look for people that are posting artwork or drawings or, you know, painting process videos, things like that. And then follow those people just so I can find people in the area. And I want to say that's how I found out about Sophia. Not sure, but I follow a lot of people that way. So I'm kind of thinking that might be it. The funny thing is, is last week when I spoke to Renee Gotro, I was actually asking Renee and asking Sophia at the same time if they wanted to be on the show. And what was confusing was, is I didn't realize through the direct message until, <laughs> until about halfway through, they have very similar icons when you're looking at, it, looking at it on a small screen on your phone. So I was actually talking to Renee thinking that I was talking to Sophia. And I realized after talking with Renee, I was just like, oh, and you live close. I wish we could just get together and talk on the show instead of having to do it online. And actually, Renee lives in Texas, so he was confused because I'm from Madison. Anyway, I reached out to Sophia. This season, I've been recording episodes over video chat, and I've been recording them and posting them to my YouTube channel, which you can find if you go to TomRaysWebsite.com. And I have a link to the YouTube there along with the podcast. Now, it's not required that people do that. So I've also been asking people, you know, if it's okay if we record the video. And Sophia didn't really want to do video, which is perfectly fine. I mean, the show for several seasons has just been an audio show. But the funny thing is, is I still do the recording over a video chat. But when we tried to do the call, we couldn't get the video to work on her end anyway. And I ended up having to use my backup backup plan, which is I recorded it over a phone call. So I had to call Sophia on my phone through my computer, through Google Hangouts, recording it that way. And so the whole conversation wouldn't have been able to be recorded on video anyway. So it worked out for the best. But I really enjoyed meeting Sophia. The work that Sophia does is just, it's, it's so unique and so great. And I really do love how she mixes medias. And we talk about how she got started, how she ended up in Madison from all the places that she lived. Don't forget to go to uh, TomRaysWebsite.com and just wanted to remind everyone that I also have been selling pop culture items and toys and you can just go there and check out the link to my eBay page and just see all the crazy crap that I'm selling. Just wanted to throw that out there in case you wanted to when you're done listening to this. Go look at some of the interesting items that I have. Also been recording videos of that, the process, the things that I find. All of it's on my YouTube channel. Just go to TomRaysWebsite.com. Anyway, here is my interview with Sophia from Black Butterfly Studio. My name is Sophia Velker. I'm an artist. My art background is mainly with acrylic on canvas, mixed media, and lately I've been mixing with uh, quick creek concrete. And my little art company is called Black Butterfly Studio. What's this thing that you're talking about where you're mixing with concrete? What's that all about? Well, I discovered um, some facets of uh, quick creek um, by accident uh, just after we moved from Las Vegas to our home here in Madison, and there were some home repairs that were needed, and we needed some quick pavers and some weights, and I discovered online through Pinterest and through some other um, uh, YouTube videos that you could actually use quick creek to create and mold whatever shape you needed um, over a span of two days after it's cured and dried and go ahead and create that and use it as pavers or as a, a way to fix something around the house that has concrete fixtures and decided, you know, let's take a try and see how well we can do this for just small sculptures. And it took off from there. So I'm still working on it, but um, little by little bit, I'm learning how to be patient with it, especially in this environment. Um, winter's being very nice and dry, but uh, yeah. Um, summer's being very, very humid. Yeah. And are those the things that I've been seeing on Instagram where, uh, one is a glove and it's, it's got, uh, like it's got a bunch of things all around it and everything. Is that one of those sculptures? Yes. Yes. Actually I have two of them. 
Uh, one is, uh, I usually um, want to actually embed something into the concrete just to give it more emphasis and more pop. And the first one I did was with the gold butterfly, which is the reflect, deflect, um, the name of that one. And you can usually use it as a little, use an incense cone uh, when you're doing your meditation or if you want to put it in your bathroom or outside. It's one of those pieces that I, I adore. And I did a upright version um, thinking maybe we could do as a multi-purpose use uh, as a keychain holder or a necklace holder, but oh, at the same yeah. time, it's not just... Yeah, something multi-purpose, art with more than just a beautiful little stand on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I actually kind of like that. You're right. It's like, instead of just going, here's something to look at, you're going, here's something to look at, and I put my keys there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And only for, that's sort of what I want to do with my art. Not just uh, not just something to pretty look at, but also something that's, when you come home, it soothes you and gives you a sense of peace, a sense of calm. Yeah. How did you end up making the hands in this process? The, with You've got a couple of different pieces here where you've uh, done the hand. And I, I originally said glove, and I was just assuming just because it kind of looks like I, mm-hmm. like you used the glove. That's, so I don't know if you did yeah, or not. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. So I'm heavily right-handed, and I put a lot of pressure on my dish gloves, and I decided instead of throwing them out, um, let's look this up and see if it's really possible. Oh. I thought I saw something like this online where you can actually take a dish glove, an old dish glove or a brand new dish glove, fill it with concrete, quickcrete in this case, um, careful with the mixture of water um, to ratio of uh, quickcrete, mix it up just so that as it dries, you don't have pockets of air because wherever there's pockets of air, that's where the weak spot will be and you're going to have a, like an issue with cracking or breaking. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, letting it dry, and after letting it dry, you can paint over that, and then um, go to town with it. <laughs> right. I love. I love that you just use the dish gloves, and also that you were like, because you go through the right-handed ones so much. It's. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if I've ever worn <laughs> through a pair of dish gloves, although I don't wear them a lot, so I guess I don't have anything to compare it to. But. Oh, I yeah, I go through them a lot because number one, I, I wear. Um, soft gold, it's a uh, white gold, and I don't, I want to protect my rings, and I was told by the jeweler who cleans my rings um, that chlorine and other cleansers, they tend to weaken the metal, so I use them to protect my rings. <laughs> huh. And me, I open beer bottles with my rings, so, you know, I don't necessarily protect <laughs> mine. <laughs> it's actually a neat trick to show people. <laughs> Oh, it's better than using your teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, and then, okay, so I also wanted to know about, uh, so you're here in Madison right now, but you are not originally from Madison, correct? You're you're from a whole bunch of different places, right? Oh, yes, definitely. So the most recent place where I've lived uh, for 25 years plus was Las Vegas. And then before that, um, before I met my husband, um, I also lived uh, Portland, Oregon, um, Gresham, Oregon, Milpita, San Jose, St. Thomas, St. Croix, and uh, now, of course, here, Madison as an adult. But as a child, I've lived other places, and it, 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 takes, um, it, it takes a lot of heart to understand the background of where you live. Yeah. Even though it's not outside of the United States, you're still going to very different regions, which still have their own very eclectic uh, cultural setting and their own type of um, beliefs. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. It's pretty nice. You, you appreciate it more as an adult than you do as a child. Yeah, I can get that. Uh, the entire time I was growing up, people would come here to Madison, and I'd be like, why are you – I want to move away from here. Why are you coming to here? <laughs> and in that same respect, why did you come here? Well, the main reason was um, as a married couple with two young children, my husband did have a um, position with the Las Vegas Wranglers and with what? that job, um, yes, Las really? Vegas Wranglers hockey team. Huh. Yes, he was a VP there. And as soon as that um, kind of subsided, the, the um, rental bid over the scene at uh, Orleans didn't wasn't renewed, we decided, okay, well, the kids are still very young. We have a choice to either stay here in Las Vegas and raise them here, or where my family on the West Coast is, or, you know, travel somewhere that he will be able to find a position for himself. And I will be a stay-at-home mom for a while mm-hmm. until we got settled, and then I'd be able to go back into uh, the workforce. Uh, but we moved here because of his job that he had, the first job that he had here in Madison. And then, of course, he's not with that 
position anymore. He's with another company. But that was one of the main reasons. And then in addition to that, um, we're not that far from his parents or his sister and his friends. They're all here in the Midwest. So okay. spanning in Indiana, um, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. So a nice string of family. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All mine are either here uh, yes. or really far away. <laughs> so you've got them yes. like in all yes. surrounding areas. That's pretty cool. Yes. Yes. And I do have a cousin that lives in Milwaukee, but um, that's as close as I can think of um, as an immediate relative that lives here in the Midwest. Okay. And how long have you been here? Uh, so far, I would say for almost seven years. Okay. Between six and seven years. So, and the reason I kind of give an approximation because my husband had to move down here first for his job, the one that he moved here for. And that was back in 2014. And then we moved later after we found a home down here in 2015 after we signed the papers and found the home that we needed. What was your, uh, when did you start actually creating artwork? Like, how far back does that go? And, like, what's your artistic background? Um, I'm self taught. The only time I did go to school for any type of art related um, education would be charcoal and pastels because that was one skill that I didn't have under my belt and I was curious as to how to use that and that was me as I was going to school for um, uh, biological sciences at UNLV. Hmm. So my major is biological sciences but I did have an elective that I chose to uh, learn to do charcoal and pastels but the rest of my background is just self-taught and experimental and you know, just ongoing. So not all mistakes are bad mistakes. Some of them are, as you would know, happy little mistakes and you create something very different and it's ongoing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, a lot of it's just self-taught and I've done this, let's see, the painting part, I would say as early as maybe the late 1990s when I felt more secure in uh, my career as a, as a student and also as an adult um, because it takes money too to buy the supplies and you have to have the space and the venue. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as the adult side of it, I've been painting since, let's say, 2000s, but it was just acrylic on canvas and then delving into the mixed media, uh, I would say strongly, um, more or less uh, early, I would say 2016, 2014, a little bit more confidence in it. And so that's how long I've been doing the mixed media portion. Okay. And what what made you even decide you're like, I want to start painting? Like you said, you started with acrylic. And you just went out and got some acrylics, and you're like, "I'm going to start doing this today." Is that is was it as easy as that? Um, no, actually, it was first photography. We delving into kind of experimental photography, and one of my really good friends, Lauren Purcell, he's a very strong. I know that everyone says don't compare yourself to others, but <laughs> when you're trying to learn something, <laughs> when you're trying to learn a new skill, so you find intimidating. How else are you going to learn? You have to mm-hmm. find a way to, to pick up those new skills. And looking at the way he handled photography, lighting, and imagery, and angling, I wanted to do the same thing, but I didn't have the camera, so I just had my, my dinky little digital camera. Yeah. As you know, back in the 90s, it wasn't as powerful as they are now. No. Um, but, yeah, I, I found that there was no way that I could master what he did, so I thought, you know, let's just try it with actual paint paint on canvas instead of on uh, charcoal paper or on watercolor board or what have you. So I decided to do that. and. Uh, one of my first ones that I attempted to do, and I I still have it to this day, it's called Wild Beauty, and it's this like, gigantic white flower, desert flower. I don't know the name of the species of flower, don't ask. <laughs> but I just <laughs> I decided to take a picture of it, and I thought, okay, well, I know this is not the, be- the best picture of this painting, but what if I could just paint it myself and give it more depth, give yeah. it more emphasis? instead of having to worry about how I would do it with the camera and when I'm not even skilled at doing that. And I, once I did that, I took off and I just fell in love with it. Wow. And I love the fact that it was all, well, my camera's not good enough, so why don't I just paint it myself? And I, I, <laughs> I enjoy that that was the concept behind it. But still, given your, the background of what you were going to school for, like what all of a sudden made you go, I want to express myself, I want to start doing art you know i I want to start painting things like i get that you were you started photography but even that it's like what made you go uh, i want to go out and it's the whole creative process based on what the you were going to school for yeah well i've also been doing drawings and and sketches since i was really little but nothing as serious as what i'm doing now which is turning into a business 
and making a little, a little a career for myself on the side. But yeah. the other thing, too, is uh, storytelling, art through storytelling. And I'm a very expressive person, mm-hmm. um, and I love color, and I love being bold, and the way to tell the story is through art. And um, even music can do that, but since I'm not a musician, <laughs> um, I felt the, the strength of using um, artwork to express how I felt, where I've been, what I see, how I interpret the world. And I've always wanted to continue doing that. And and now I've seen the realm of how art can affect people um, on every realm of life. It's, it's amazing. So uh, being even in school and doing that small elective class, um, I wanted to take off with it and continue from there um, and finding the venue to do it. So actually going into public, my first, I would say, art festival was in uh, Henderson, the Green Valley District. And this is back in, I believe, in, I want to say the ninth, 1990, no, early 2000s, I want to say. Okay. And even then, I, I I hungered for it. I kept on wanting to go for it because I thought people loved it. And they said, what's the story behind this? And I would tell them, well, this is, it's like looking at photos. So mm-hmm. instead of me showing you a photo, I would paint something that I wanted to tell a story about because of an experience that I had or hearing someone else's experience and painting about it hmm. and creating artwork from there. So basically I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to actually be peace of mind to people's um, hearts and just let them know, hey, this is how I interpret the world. This is who I am. And not just with how I dress and my hairstyle, but also um, through my artwork. I, I love that you were like, you can't play music, but... You also weren't painting beforehand, too. So have you ever tried doing music? Because maybe you're just automatically really good at it. I don't know. <laughs> no, actually, you know, that's the funny thing that you asked, because I do, um, when we moved here, um, there were a lot of things that we decided not to take with us because um, it wasn't necessary. We knew they were going to be placed. You know, one of them, the, one of that would be furniture. My husband has an acoustic guitar, one of those small acoustic guitars, um, he bought that many, many decades, years before he met me because he had Achilles tendon surgery and had it to uh, rest it in between re- uh, recovering. And he bought the guitar as a way to um, stave off boredom. Uh, but he never okay. got back to it. And he was about to leave the guitar when we left Vegas. I was like, don't you dare. We can use that. And if you don't use it, the kids are going to use it. If uh, the kids don't use it, I'll use it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I <laughs> using YouTube, the miracle of YouTube. I sat down one day and my kids and I decided, let's see if there's something on that we can try out. Unfortunately, it's adult size, not for children. Yeah. And I, I'm still trying to go back to wanting to learn. And it's, in my opinion, I think keyboarding is a lot easier than oh, yeah. uh, guitar. Yeah. No, it, it, it is. That's uh, one of the things that I've, uh, when I make music, I mainly use the keyboard because I'm like, well, I know where the notes are. I'll figure it out later. And then I never do. So I always end up just sticking with keys. Yeah. Was, I don't know. I, I, I get my friend Lauren has learned. He, I don't know if he went through an instructor or if he taught himself or was a combination. I forget which, but he um, is really good at um, playing the guitar. So. Oh. I thought to myself, you know, if he can do the guitar, then I will continue with learning how to do the piano for my children. <laughs> okay. So, see, you are actually getting the ability to play music. I knew that it couldn't be completely like you can't be, you can't play music. I knew there had to be something in there. <laughs> I didn't believe you for a Complete second. Complete calm death. <laughs> <laughs> and you had mentioned that you got into uh, mixed media later on. So, what what was the process into getting to into mixed media, and also what kind of mixed media are you, you are you doing? So, in the past, uh, with some of my paintings getting more and more texturized, I wanted to add more expression, more depth, and just the paint alone, globbing paint on there by itself, I started learning how to use um, acrylic polymer medium and different um, types of hue, different types of levels of semi, gloss, and matte, and I noticed that it, it had a really good finish to it, and sometimes it would be mistaken as an oil painting, and it's acrylic because mm. of the way you finish it, even after varnishing. And then on top of that, if it wasn't the um, uh, polymer mi- mixture, the medium, acrylic medium, then it was the gesso that I would use as the texture and the paint over that. And that I fell in love with the look and the finish of it. And I decided, well, what, how else, what else could we do um, to make it more expressive, more depth, more eye-catching, more pop, more emphasis in a certain area of the painting? And I looked at... Uh, I'm looking at the bucket right now. It's called Proform uh, Professional Formula, but it's a lightweight 
joint compound. Basically, it's um, drywall mud. Okay. I was and just going to say, what's joint compound? Because I know, I, I don't know what it is. It, I'm sure other people probably do, but I know that you've done a few and they even, they even kind of look like sculptures, but it's also, you, you, you've said that it's acrylic. I want to say that there's one where there's like a face shooting out of a canvas or something like that. And I'm like, is that really just acrylic or like, did you slop on the paint and make a sculpture out of it? Or uh, so tell me more <laughs> about using the joint compound. So with the joint compound, um, and that's a really good example. I'm glad you brought that one up. That one's called uh, Black as Gold. That one that was sold already. Um, just in case anyone's wondering, let me hear this piece later. Uh, but that was basically a, a canvas board, and then I used drywall mud and sculpted it using um, very fine, extensive tools such as a spoon, a baby butter knife, and my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. And once <laughs> once the drywall dry once the drywall mud or the joint compound dried, then I went ahead and took a really soft um sandpaper. I'm looking for the grade now. I don't have the grade in front of me. But it's not the really heavy coarse sandpaper because that's not necessary. Because when drywall dries, it finally is set and cured, then you can go in and it's pretty soft and you want to go ahead and do that outdoors or have your mask on in a setting where there's an exhaust fan because of the dust. But just a really light um, sanding down to smooth the edges if you want to have a smoother look. And then once that's done, then I go ahead and apply the acrylic right onto the drywall as if you're painting over a wall itself. That's the one that I fell in love with and I decided just to carry on forward with the next the next pieces. I had a, a smaller one. It's not as impressive, in my opinion, for myself, but it was experimental. So hmm. You had talked about how you were... Um trying to start a business and do this for yourself. How did you make that transition into just creating things and then into, you had mentioned you've, uh, you got into some shows and you had done some uh, galleries and, and things. Did you just start putting yourself out there? Was there any sort of process that you did to try and do more of the business side? Or is that even just something where it's like, you've always known it? Like what, what was your transition into turning this into sort of a business and selling things? The transition actually occurred. Um, I'm still uh, have a full time job actually, okay. but at the same time, I'm, this is also my side business as well. Well, I shouldn't say side business, but it is my business yeah. in, as a whole. But um, um, I'm also a full time worker again as an artist, but I work with another company um, doing digital work. Oh, neat. And as far as the transition um, goes. I noticed that um, with the shows that I did back in Las Vegas, um, with the high number of face-to-face -face contact and popularity with certain pieces and series of my artwork, I decided to make it a solid yes, keep going, keep make this make this real. Just stop talking about it and make it real. We're all going to stumble at some point during the process, but just make it real and keep going. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that occur, um, as you know, like right now, this this year right. um, that are going to create challenges. And um, it's a little wobbly right now, but I'm still moving forward. I mean, there's there's still little areas, venues, where you can um, pop it open, such as digital. But the transitioning of me going into just experimental art to actually make it into a business, um, that occurred after several encounters um, in Las Vegas uh, with customers buying my artwork and asking questions. And then all of a sudden, we just sit there and we start talking about our lives, personal stuff, mm. more so them, me just listening, because they would see a painting or they would see an art piece. And they would, whether they purchased it or didn't purchase it, it just made them, it provoked them to, to share something personal with me. And I decided, you know what, there's something to this. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep going with this. Yeah. Uh, I've, I had that same sort of... Uh, thing occur when I did a few pop-ups and I was mainly there just kind of like, here are some, I mean, I do web comics, you know, it's, it's like you can buy a picture, that sort of thing. But I also had brought my microphone because I'm doing the podcast and I wanted to meet people and people would come up and look mm -hmm. at it. And you're right. They, it, it would just start a conversation and they would see something and go, Oh, the reason they would stop is because they looked and they're like, what's that? And something clicked with them. And then there was an attachment just by looking at it. And even with my dumb little web comics, they, they would, you know, and more so probably with a painting and they would want to talk about it or have something to share. And you're right. And I found that fascinating. It was so interesting. Some of the things that I would hear from people. Um, and so you decided to take that and 
try and bring that out more. Like, uh, so did you then transition to selling things online or was it doing more galleries and more shows and booking yourself places? It was actually doing more galleries and, and uh, more um, uh, face-to-face. Okay. Right now, uh, with, the Madison, with Madison, I've just started, not this year, but I would say, I want to say about between 2017 and 2018, trying to get out there in the public here in Madison itself and the surrounding areas where I can get a reach out to them, um, doing festivals there. And this year, between this year and the middle to the end of last year, I really started plugging away and applying to uh, art festivals, not just here in Madison, but in Milwaukee, um, mm-hmm. not for, uh, other places that are t- not too far for us to travel to, um, and wanted to continue doing that. And as far as the online goes, I am actually working on cleaning up my shopping cart and just pushing forward and, and sending that out there. I've been talking to my friends and they're, <laughs> they're already saying, yeah, why haven't you done that already? <laughs> and it's, <laughs> Easy for them to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of work that goes behind it. I, I mean, know. I, there's a, you could, yeah, you have to actually be established and make sure everything's there and, and the legality behind you, your shipments and people making sure that there's no scam artists and they're actually real. Right. There's a lot of other stuff that goes between it. Not, not excuses, real reasons, real hard facts. Because even I thought, oh, it would be easy. I'd just go in there, plop some stuff in there, set my shopping cart up. It's good. Good yeah. to go. Well, yeah, that's great. But you have to do more than that. You have to actually set up a schedule. Where are they going to pick it up if they have a pickup? Mm-hmm. And if you are going to ship it to them, make sure the price range is right in there. Um, Some of the shipping costs, I I would definitely have to eat, obviously. Um, I would like to push it over to the final, as a final cost included with the product itself. But there, at some point you have to have a little break, a breaking point. Yeah. Um, How um, heavy are the pieces? When you mentioned shipping, I didn't even think of that. Like, your pieces are larger. They've uh, you've incorporated mixed media into it. Now you're working with concrete, so shipping. <laughs> <laughs> so shipping gets heavier and heavier for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So no, with the concrete, that would not be a shipping. That would do a local sell for that one. Yeah, because it wouldn't be fair. And then you have to worry about the damages. Right. And um, would it be safe to get there? And there's customs, and it's a lot. Of, it's a, it's really difficult. So for that, I would do a personal um, face-to-face sell for that one or local, or a, as close to local as possible. That's a good point. Yeah. That, that would be heartbreaking if you shipped it and it broke. That would be so horrible. Yeah. I'm just thinking about that now and I'm like, oh, that would be nothing you could do about it. I mean, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, no. That upsets me even <laughs> just thinking about it hypothetically. Um, <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Along with that, what would you say is like probably one of the biggest challenges you have doing artwork or, you know, trying to be an artist? Well, as a a full-time, I am a full-time employee and also at the same time, a mother of two children, um, I would say finding time. So you have to have and be very, I wouldn't say rigid with your schedule because there's no such thing as being rigid. Even if you didn't have children, things pop up, but um, having a schedule, period. And trying to adhere to it and making sure that, you know what, I have this much time. Um, I'm going to dedicate myself to this. And if you're sick or if one of the kids is sick, you know, if there is a doctor's appointment. So at at nighttime, I usually find myself between Thursday and Saturday um, and maybe sometimes Sunday morning if I'm lucky, Mm -hmm. um, being able to create my artwork at nighttime by myself when everyone's in bed. So I come downstairs. Um, shut everything down, just have the music playing and just do whatever is one I need to do. And um, then I have my admin day. I know it sounds weird to say that, but I call it admin day where you do nothing mean. but office. Yeah, exactly. You have to be, you know, you the, the adult stuff, the uncomfortable stuff, the right. boring stuff. Yeah. So sitting down, revamping your website, researching, even though it looks like you're not researching because people come down, if your husband or wife comes down, they see you on YouTube or reading an <laughs> article, they're like, you're not working. <laughs> no, some of it's research. Okay. There's, there's one thing, uh, and this is, this is a good and horrible example, but there's that documentary that's out about the woman that was writing the true crime novel who was married to Patton Oswald, who sadly passed away. But while she was oh, yeah. work while she was working on the book and she was getting frustrated, but it would take forever. And he was like, you take as long as you need. And, you know, because he also writes books and he's a stand up, he's an actor and artist and all that kind of stuff. And he says to her, you take as long as you need. Cause I know that you need that time to get into 
the mode and get where you need, like, you can't just sit down and go, okay, now I'm working. Boom. Off and running. No, Mm -hmm. you gotta like, you gotta look at things and get the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Maybe look up like, okay, what are some methods? What am I thinking of? And you get into it. And then the last like hour is where you actually do the work, but you have to work up to that point. And when I heard him say that, I'm like, that makes so much sense. And it's kind of what you're saying too. Like, I'm not watching YouTube. I'm looking at something because I was trying to think of something and I'm looking it up and then learning more about it and it's inspiring me. And then I'm going to be off and running, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That is correct to the point. And it's the same thing with what I'm doing right now with my mixed media. I mean, heck, I'm even looking at dr- driftwood because of all the lakes and the oh, stuff that yeah. washes up. And I'm inspired by that. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, I could do that. But uh, I did one driftwood piece, just a small one, just an experimental one. But also, I was like, you know what? It'll be for sale if someone wants it. And it's on my website. But I did that, and I found out, okay, I have to bleach it for how long? And how often do I have to change the water? <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if this is for me. That's a, that's a little toxic, and it just seems a little a little too much for me. Me saying that uh, as a person that's also using drywall and having to wait for it to, to to dry, but while that's drying, you also move on to the next project. So you always have something in the waiting yeah. room or in the queue as you're working on something else. And at least that's how I do it. It's the same thing with when you're brainstorming. And again, back to what we were talking about, um, having that mode, that momentum. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same thing with brainstorming. If you're working on a piece and you're getting so frustrated and you're just tired of looking at it because you've looked at it four days straight, oh. and like, yeah, you, yeah, you're getting, <laughs> you're getting carried away. Like, I posted this on Instagram. People are going to sit in there going, when's she going to go and post that? Is that for sale? Yes, she said it was for sale. <laughs> <laughs> so you move on to the next piece. So that way you can just kind of, you know, defrag your mind and just move on to the next one and move on to the next one. And then eventually, before you know, you have three pieces that are finished because you've returned to them at certain points um, of the week or the month and you're done with all yeah. three. I've found overlapping. I, I used to refer to it as multitasking, but I think it's more overlapping. Like that's exactly it. You can't just work on one thing and not have another one that you can switch to. It's, it's horrible to go like, God, I have three things I have to finish. But at the same time, like you said, you're looking at it and it's like, I can't, I'm stuck on this. And you can just walk away and come back later and then continue to work on it. Or you can go, Oh, but what if I tried that over here on this thing that I'm doing? And then it, it it just makes your mind shift a little instead of just focusing on the one thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And with the, with, it, it works. It, yeah, it does. It does. And I've, but here's, here's what I was going to ask you next. So you've got that where you've had, you said your admin days and then your creative days and that's brilliant. And I've done that too, but how do you not sometimes make your, or how do you stop yourself? from making the excuse that it's going to be okay to do you're, you're thinking so much about the admin thing on a day you're supposed to be creative that you don't, I let myself get a overly focused on one or the other. Sometimes, sometimes it'll be like, I'll do the admin stuff later. I have so much stuff to work on, or I am really into working on my website and sending out emails right now. Maybe I'll, I'll continue working tomorrow. How do you stay in that schedule that you've set for yourself? Currently, um, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, I actually am able to uh, set myself the deadlines because of other people's deadlines. So if there's oh. something that someone has requested, um, I don't know, it sounds like project management all over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. But, That's a good thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. You kind of do have to be your own project manager with a little give, little give and take on both parts, um, both on your end and also on the person that you're communicating with. Because not everything is about you. Some of the, the, the projects or items on your to-do list um, are personal, but at the same time, what if you're trying to assist someone or someone's asking you about um, one of your pieces of work, you have to schedule something with them. So that's outside of the creative and outside of an admin. It's kind of a combination of both. So whether you're doing a commission piece and then you have to go drop off artwork at someone else's house, mm-hmm. it's a combination of everything. So those deadlines are fixed because you've already agreed upon it with that, um, the other party. Um, with the ad- admin stuff, like you're updating your website um, or including something or excluding something because it wasn't a great sale or you don't feel it will be mm-hmm. or you just love it too much and you don't want to let it go, um, those things you work into the flux, for me, that's not difficult for me to, to do. It's the creative part that's difficult for me to um, stop 
put a halt to it. Right. So that's why I'd rather create later in the week than early in the week. So that way I'm not exhausted when I go back to work. Um, and I have my eight hours a day, uh, regardless of whether I'm working from home because of virtual learning with the children right now, yeah. or because I'm actually physically in the office, I don't want to stretch myself out too much. So if I, in the beginning of the week, if I am planning that, Mondays, um, usually I have as a, and I just added something new to my Mondays. Mondays are usually um, time spent with my husband and I, with, even if we're just decompressing, watching stupid movies, or right. um, on my added list was looking at um, movies online, which is uh, which is also some like short films, little short films, mm-hmm. or reading. And that's one of my new ones is I added back on reading because I haven't done that in forever, and I want to go back to reading, just quietly reading, sitting on my bed or oh. downstairs and just chilling, listening to music while I'm reading. And I haven't done that in a while, so I added that to my Monday list. When you say looking up movies online, are you saying looking for ones to watch, or are you saying looking just for different types of online shorts by, like, creators? By other creators. So okay. there's two, yeah, there's two different, I don't know what you call them. I'm horrible at uh, nomenclature with this, but on YouTube, uh, there's, yes, I'm a heavy YouTube user. <laughs> on YouTube, <laughs> there are two different platforms or channels, I guess you can call them channels. Uh-huh. Uh, one of them is called Amaletto, and the other one's called Dust. So Dust, D U D is in Delta, U S T, they have award winning short films that are sci fi based. Really? And then we, oh yeah, this, it's so much fun. Oh my God. Some of them are humorous and some of them are, you know, thought provoking. It's a combination of everything. It's a lot of sci fi, but even a genre that in their own, like sci fi comedy, sci fi rom com, you, you name it. But they have different episodes under that um, channel. Huh. And then the second one that I, I love, enjoy watching, actually, I finished watching that just as a decompress before I went upstairs after painting, was, uh, is Amaletto. O M E L E T O. Okay. Uh, Amaletto, yes. And they do a lot of thought provoking um, short films as well. And it, it pretty much is wide berth and it's comedy, action, drama, um, um, political. It's anything and everything you can think of. They, 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 it's jarring sometimes to watch some of it, but then at the same time, you're like, I would have never thought of it that way in that person's perspective. Or huh. it's mystery, you know. It's, it, they they lend themselves as being very very, I don't know, very uh, deep thinking type of uh, short film type of uh, channel. I like them. At least that's my opinion. I think they're they're very thought provoking. I had never heard of that before, and it's it sounds interesting as all get out. How did you discover this? Actually, it was maybe I would say since 2020. So I would think I don't know if it was 2016 or 2017 when I accidentally ran into a film, and I was just researching something during my uh, research time. I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. And I wanted to see if there was a subject line based on uh, something I was doing. I think it was like a, I was getting interested, just then getting interested in doing more mixed media. And I saw something, um, I don't, don't ask me what the film was because I don't remember right now. Okay. But there was a film on that. <laughs> it was a humorous film and it had to do with an artist. And then there was another one. It was called Stutter. Um, I think that was Amaletto. Um, I think there's the ones that that actually that out. sounds familiar. I'm in front of my computer. Okay. Yeah, that's a O M E L E T O short film. So 2016 Oscar winning short, uh, Stutterer. So S T U T T E R E R. Okay. Um, screening room, and that's a really good. That was I thought it was the one that got me hooked, and I'm just continued watching a lot of their short films from there. So the funny thing was, is I was going to ask you if there are any obsessions that you have right now. And I love that we, we just instantly went into this without me asking. This is, I'm, I'm really intrigued by all this stuff <laughs> you're talking about. I, I'm going to check this out later on. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, I, I almost completely forgot, but at the beginning, I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with the name for uh, what you use for your online cart? So Black Butterfly uh, Studio came up because, number one, when I did um, a little bit before 2007, actually, um, I was sitting down with a friend of mine who still lives in, in Vegas, and uh, Patricia asked me, do you want to name it something that's um, thought-provoking, something that's compelling, something that really says you? And I thought to myself, I want I want all of it, but also has a little me. So I chose Black Butterfly. Um, number one, um, Black is sophisticated. It's very um, serious. It's graceful. It's elegant color. But butterfly, because it's ever-changing. So everyone's always in a cocoon, regardless of whether you 
you've changed yourself one day and you thought you've evolved and you understood and learned something new, mm -hmm. but then you're back in the cocoon um, two months down the road. And that's the way I, how I see art. Um, it's ever changing like a butterfly. So one season after another season, there's always going to be a new, a new breed or a new um, group or a new outlet of artwork. And that's yeah. how I see art. It's just as a butterfly. And it's black and elegant. It's just sophisticated. It has something to say. It's very serious at one moment, but at the same time, very elegant in another. How soon did you, after that, did you do the logo that you use? Um, that was that was a little bit later down the line. Um, I want to say uh, I took my time on that one because uh, I didn't have the software that I do now, which is I use Affinity Designer. It's a vector program. Oh, okay. I was using, yeah, I was using, um, let's do this. I was cutting and pasting clip art and at the same time creating my own little uh, um, work. But it was through uh, Pixelmator and I was using the Pixelmator program, which is a lot cheaper at the time and I'm not using that anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was a more of a crude uh, vector program that I was using. And I started creating it that way, and it was a lot easier for me to just create the logo than to uh, create it uh, practically, like on canvas, take a picture of it, and then create it into a logo. And that I thought that was just a bit much, mm -hmm. and it'd be easier just to do a digital, um, a digital uh, draft of it first, and clean it up, and then go from there. And I'm going to have to go back and revisit that, and to actually uh, give it a more of a high res resolution, so that way I'll be able to. Um, expand it the way I need to without it being kind of pixelated because right now it's a little outdated as far as the format. So so you've tried expanding it and it, it, is, it hasn't worked for you? Uh, not yet because I haven't revisited. That's my admin day. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean I didn't mean to talk admin work on your on your <laughs> creative day. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine because it's, it's as we're talking. I have some little things that are being che checked off or added to the list as we're talking. And that's and just as you mentioned, logo, I was like. Yeah, I'm going to get back to that. Yeah. Oh, all right, oh. better do that now, better do that now. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> and then I just wanted to ask you one more thing, uh, which is just basically, is there anything you'd like to mention that uh, you'd like to tell people about you'd just like people to know, or uh, is there anything you'd like to mention before we sign off today? Yeah, I'm actually still trudging for the um, art festivals once they're back up. Um, and going, um, hopefully next year right away. And if not, then 2022. For my personal gain, I'm just doing them preferably 2022. That way everything is sound. Yeah. And then I'm working on a few projects to incorporate um, my storytelling with my painting. Um, that was the Little Man series. I do have a book that I'm working on right now, but it would be for the illustrations. And once I'm finished with that, then posting that and having that up for sale. Oh, wow. You're working on a book. I didn't know that. Yes, and that would be for um, one of my paintings that uh, I don't have in my position sold, thank goodness. I'm happy that person was so happy with it. Oh. Um, but it's part of my Little Man series. It was called um, Wish Upon a Feather, and that's a children's book. And I finished the text. I got it edited. But right now, it's the next grueling task is actually being able to do the illustrations myself and making sure that I have that formatted as well. Are you going to be doing the illustrations by hand, or are you going to be doing those uh, through graphic software as well? That'll be good through graphic software. Okay. Are you self-publishing the book? Um, yes. I'm in the still in the mood of publishing the book because um, I wanted to actually have a cohesive line with it. Yeah. Having both the visual added with the text, and that way um, everything is set to go together and on a smooth timeline so that's separately. Wow. It's it's so fascinating. There there are quite a few people that I've talked to who are doing books as well. I, I enjoy that people are making books. I think it has something to do with the childhood, people reminiscing and uh, going back, being just a little nostalgic about it. Um, especially right now, I have to, I know we keep on saying, oh, well, thanks to COVID or thanks to the pandemic, but it really, right. because of the pandemic, it's given us all a chance to step back and be a little bit more old fashioned uh -huh. with tactile and sensory and our experiences with our family and our children. For those of us that have children and be able to sit down with books, because we, my husband and I, we still have books here in the house. So not all of it's digital. A lot of the books are um, the traditional page training books, not mm -hmm. the digital stuff. And I thought, well, if we're enjoying this so much, and I see some kids actually doing going back to that, then yes, by all means, we should be able to do this. And I would like to provide it as online, of course, and then, of course, in print. Yeah, there's still, it's still good to have both options. 
I, I think. <laughs> exactly. Oh, but, yeah, definitely. Definitely. But I do like the physical books as well, although I, I feel like the pinch and zoom when there are pictures in it doesn't seem to work as good. Ha! Um, <laughs> sorry. I just had to make that dumb joke. <laughs> and then uh, where would you like people to go to see your work? Uh, uh, to your website or your Instagram or both? Would you like to just mention where that oh, is? Both. Okay. Definitely both. Um, so they can go to my Instagram account, um, the Black Butterfly Studio. And then for my website, it would be blackbutterflystudio.com. And it's one of the first um, searches that pops up. So let's just say Black Butterfly Studio. And then for my Instagram account, it will say the Black Butterfly Studio. Thank you very much for talking with me, me today. And I was, I'm, I'm really glad that I got a chance to meet you. Oh, definitely. Same here. Likewise. Thank you so much for giving the opportunity to speak with you.